The Power Week with Jeremy Maggs, Sunday 10 a.m. to noon on Power 98.7. Now, we're talking. In the second hour of the Power Week, how to market to the LGBT community. That story coming up in just a moment. We're also going to tell you about an exciting new venture here in Johannesburg for the arts community. And a little later, I'm going to introduce you to two young men changing the face of advertising. They say they can't sell themselves on their blackness alone. It's provocative and it's interesting. It's a five minutes past 11 o'clock. A very warm welcome to the Power Week with Jeremy Maggs, media and popular culture, what people are reading, what they're watching and what they're listening to and why. My Twitter handle is Mags on Media. You can also use Power FM 987. Power 98.7. Now we're talking. So here's an item that caught our eye this week. How to overcome the four biggest blunders in pursuit of something termed the pink rand. In other words, marketing to the lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender community. Mike Dos Santos has written on the issue. He's a strategist. He's from the agency called the Strategy Department. Mike Dos Santos, good morning to you and uh, welcome to the program. Hey, Jeremy, how are you? Good to talk to you. Let's start Great. off with some context first, if we can. This, yes. uh, th- this uh, LGBT community, how big is it? How influential is it economically in South Africa? Well, um, Jeremy, we're looking at a market around the size of 5 million consumers. So um, this was based on a, on a study that was done by the Associated Business Network of South Africa uh, a couple of years back, which, which found that roughly 10% of the market in South Africa is gay or lesbian. So looking at the current size of the South African population being 54 million, we could just extrapolate the size of the market to be roughly 5 million consumers, which um, interestingly enough is about the size of the population of Pretoria and Cape, mm. and Cape Town combined. Am I correct in, in saying 5 million consumers possibly with more disposable income than others? Absolutely. So studies um, worldwide and certainly mirrored in the study that was done in South Africa have shown that um, this market tends to have a slightly higher than average disposable income. So definitely a, a market that's quite lucrative and, and very much appealing to, to, the, um, to the advertiser and the marketer. And Mike, is the broad thinking here that companies and brands don't necessarily understand the segment, but they really want their business and their money? Yes, I think that's one of the big problems actually in in, in, in current state of affairs is that there's this need to to go after the pink rand as as you mentioned earlier there's some awareness that the, the market is, is of a certain size and a certain stature but a lack of understanding and a lack of authenticity in terms of what the actual hot buttons are within that market that would actually enable one to to resonate from a brand communication perspective what don't they understand i think um a lot of the time there's the subtle things like um for instance um looking at the travel industry um Speaking from experience of, of some people that, that I know in, in my circle of friends, mm. um, booking accommodation for oneself and one's partner and then being asked, um, would you like two single beds for your room, for, for instance, or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's Where, extraordinary for, that this still happens. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's a, it's a problem that needs to be um, addressed if, if brands are wanting to be authentic mm. and to resonate with, within that segment. You've got uh, four blunders, exclusion, inauthenticity, assumption and insinuation, also stereotyping. I want to get to those in just a moment. Yes. But before we get there, can you lump this entire community into one category? It's, it's, in many ways, it's like saying uh, exactly the same thing about the black market, which marketers like to refer to, uh, which we all know is very layered and very nuanced. Isn't exactly the same thing applying to the LGBT community? Absolutely. I think there's definitely this um, assumption that we, we're speaking of, of a monolithic market, mm. when in fact we're looking at, at four sub-segments with various sub-segments within those sub-segments. So absolutely a, a case of not wanting to lump them together as, as one monolithic um, segment. Mm. Of the four, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender, w- which would be the market in, in ascendancy? Which would, which would be the one that, that uh, marketers should be focusing their attention on? Or is that a disingenuous question? Well, um, no, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fair question. I would say that the, um, the bulk of the studies that have been done on the segments have focused specifically on the lesbian and gay, uh, gay um, segments of, of the markets. Uh, I would say perhaps there's a greater need for understanding of, of the bisexual and, and the transgender side. I don't think too many studies have been done specifically from a South African perspective to understand mm-hmm. those segments um, a lot better. In your very well-written piece, you say one of the key advantages uh, that South African marketers have is the opportunity to learn from the successes and conversely the failures of international brands in their attempts at engaging the LGBT market over the past couple of years. Uh, We do know that there have been some very ham-fisted attempts at trying to uh, corral this market. Where have the failures been? Who's got it wrong? 
Well, um, I'll give an example actually from a South African perspective of a brand that um, wasn't necessarily targeting the LGBT community, but used an, an appeal in their messaging that sort of alienated and, and painted a very stereotypical view and actually was quite controversial. I won't mention the brand's name, but it was a brand of margarine, uh, whose brand promises all around heart health and mm. promoting a healthy heart. So think, you know I who think, we, we're think, talking I about. Think, I think you know, I know where you're going with this one, yes. Yes. <laughs> Flora, yeah, okay. Yes. So what they did was they, they, ran a, they ran a print campaign in 2013, I believe it was, yeah. where they um, looked at the, the whole idea of you need a healthy and strong heart today. And uh, one of the executions featured a, a human heart made out of China with a, a bullet with text in it hurtling towards the heart. And in the text, in the bullet, the text said something along the lines of, I'm dad, I'm gay. Mm-hmm. And so basically the insinuation there was that um, coming out is something that will shatter the hearts of parents, which, which might be the case um, in some cases. But I think the, the issue there was that it essentially took that moment of coming out, which is quite a um, momentous and often very anxiety and very stressful situation, yeah. and reduced it to a cheap joke to plug margarine. So <laughs> I feel that... So do brands, in, get, this, like that. Do, do brands get this wrong in, in, in just the messaging, in other words, the copy that they're putting across, or is it more subtle? Is it in the tonality? Is it, is it in the nuance? Is it in the language? I feel it can be um, a combination. I, I think that there are various elements where one needs to be cognizant as, as a marketer and as a as strategist or as a communicator of, of how you resonate with your audience. So things like language, things like symbolism, things like insinuations, going back to those blunders that you mentioned earlier on, um, are definitely things that I think um, can, can backfire. I think sometimes we do also tend to take ourselves a little bit too too seriously as people. Um, there, there are cases where, you know, we have a sense of humor and we can laugh about certain things. Like, for instance, the, um, the Net Florist campaign with yeah. um, Harold's relationship hotline, which I, which I quite like. And um, those executions, I think that paints maybe a stereotypical picture of, of the gay man. But at the same time, there's, um, there's a certain human truth and, and a resonance and a, an endearment in that. But who determines so I think, I think the line? Way. Who determines the line between something that's humorous and something that's offensive? Or is it a moving target? Um, I feel like, attitudes are changing. I think as, as societies become more accepting of, of the LG, LGBT community, that um, we ourselves as a community tend to um, have, a, have a sense of humor about things. So I think that the lines are, are shifting, but obviously it, it boils down to the individual at the end of the day. So Net and Florist, we can't be everything to everyone. Sure. Net Florist then is one brand that's got it right locally. Anybody else that, that actually has a decent understanding of this community? Yes, um, I can give an example of a budget rental car, car budget car rental. Um, they've often showed their support of the local LGBT, LGBT community and, and causes. So, for instance, in 2012, they ran a campaign titled The Gay Flag of South Africa Coach Tour. Well, just to give you a bit of background on that, it was to commemorate the, the launch of South Africa's official gay flag, which is a combination of the international rainbow flag and mm. the South African flag. Interestingly enough, on that, South Africa is the first country in the world to actually recognize an LGBT symbol officially. So what they did as part of this was, you, you're familiar with the movie Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Sure. So they, they branded a Terence big... Stamp, if I remember yes, correctly. Absolutely, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And that dates so they, both of us, my friend. For sure, for sure. And they, what they did was <laughs> they branded a massive um, budget bus, yeah. um, and um, they, they, they ran this tour across the country where they actually promoted an understanding and an acceptance of LG, LGBT people. Mm starting in Cape Town, going all the way to Joburg, stopping at various points along the way. And uh, what they did to actually drive engagement and to um, drive a CSI angle as well, to actually show that they're not just um, trying to go after the market, but actually putting money back towards causes was a very, very big success story for, for that brand. Mike DeSantos, given that we live in an inherently conservative society, yes. um, is there risk attached to that kind of campaign? Absolutely. I think even in more liberal societies around the world, uh, we see that sort of backlash when a brand actively tries to align itself to the LGBT community. I'll give you an example. One of the ones that I referenced in my article, which was the um, ANZ Bank of New Zealand. They ran their, their gay TMs, as they called them, over Auckland Pride um, last year. And essentially what it was was a festive makeover for various ATMs in and around the city. And um, they, they donated money from transactions to a local um, support line mm. for LG, LGBT people. What they found, though, was that some of the ATMs were vandalized. So I think even in a more developed and a more liberal society, we, we see that backlash, mm. which is, I think, one of the reasons why too many, too many marketers and too many brands are reluctant to align themselves to the LG, LGBT market. And that's exactly the point. What, what do you then say to marketers who say, let me not bother with this particular segment because it's inherently too dangerous and could damage my brand reputation? 
I would literally point to the success stories of, of the brands that have done so, have seen results, and I think our society is changing. Things are changing, norms are changing. As I mentioned in my article as well, normal is becoming the new normal. So as, um, as society becomes more accepting of the LGBT markets and, con- and consumer and people, we, we actually see the shifting of norms. So I think over time, things might be different. What's the approach here then? Does one need to be more consultative with the community? Definitely. I think uh, the brands that have really gotten it right are those that have gotten to understand the consumer, to immerse themselves in the consumer's world and to avoid falling back on those trite portrayals and stereotypes and cliches that are too prevalent within, within the field of LGBT marketing. Explain to me, though, what the fundamental difference is between a heterosexual consumer and uh, a gay consumer when it comes to buying uh, any type of product. H- how, would, how would the messaging need to change? I think it, I mean, surely if you're selling can, shaving cream, you're selling shaving yes. cream. You know, the the <laughs> attributes are exactly the same. For sure. It's depend, dependent on the product category, of course. But I think there, there are cases where, for instance, um, a, a gay person might feel excluded by a brand through the insinuations used in language, like we said earlier on. So the examples of you and your wife, where, for instance, that might not be the case. So assuming the gender of, of a person's spouse. That sort of thing. All right, so let's look at the blunders very quickly. Um, yes. Point one is exclusion. What are you saying? What, what, should, be, what should be avoided there? Well, there it's, it's quite simply uh, avoiding the, the exclusion of the consumer when looking at your, your total marketing mix and your communication mix. Mm-hmm. I think uh, too many brands have been um, uh, overly, overly conscious of being associated with the LGBT markets to the point that they've either excluded or been what I termed inclusively exclusive, mm-hmm. where they've actually um, thought that all they need to do is incidentally be in the places and the spaces where LGBT people are and that that's enough to, to drive um, engagements and sales. The, the, the second point you make is inauthenticity, but that would apply surely to any brand. Yes, absolutely. I think as, as marketers, as strategists, we, we always strive to be authentic in our communication and in our approach to engaging the consumer. But I, I feel that in this market specifically, um, a lack of understanding and a lack of authenticity um, can yield some very terrible results. We've spoken about stereotyping, and, and the other one which is allied to that is assumption and insinuation. And th- yes. that, that's just uh, that, that's taking the mickey. Absolutely. Either taking the mickey or sometimes I think it's done unintentionally. For example, through language, like the, the gay lifestyle was an example that I used in my, in my article. I think um, too often we, we throw this term around and then not realizing the insinuation behind that. So the insinuation being that being gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender is simply a lifestyle choice and, and not something that's innate to a person. Mike De Santos, thank you very much indeed. Uh, he is a strategist with the company, the agency, the Strategy Department. This is the Power Week with Jeremy Max.